Okay, so right now, first thing we're going to cover is in this introduction to TensorFlow Quantum is working with quantum data. TFQ is working with quantum data. So we can think about um, working with both classical and quantum data with quantum machine learning, but uh, personally, and uh, you know, this isn't just an opinion shared by me, but the, the best speed ups for quantum machine learning will come from purely quantum data. And what do we mean by quantum data? Simply unparametrized quantum circuits. And today we'll be doing a simple example using quantum data with purely quantum machine learning. You can combine it to make hybrid models, but we'll just be working with pure quantum stuff today. And so first, uh, we, you know, why I want to explain why I think there's a the potential for a speed up. And that's because uh, quantum data, you know, if you have this unparametrized circuit, there's difficulties much as there is moving classical data to quantum data, but moving the quantum data to classical data. And so I think there's a lot of potential there. So um, first of all, this relies on some knowledge of TensorFlow, knowledge of um, quantum uh, computing basics, Don't doesn't need a lot of quantum machine learning. And so basically the problem we'll be tackling today is a pretty simple one, very similar to the one given in the white paper, which I highly recommend you read and I'll link below. Um, and that is for a qubit, um, you generate data. Uh, points that are either close to the poles of the z, the z poles, and we measure in the x basis. And so we want to know, we label these as 1, we label these as negative 1, so we're doing, um, for binary classification, we're going to be using the hinge loss function. Um, and so we want to basically think about moving these to here and moving these to here and then we measure and we'll measure correctly. So it's a pretty uh, pretty simple example. Um, and so the we want to first think about our design philosophy. What do we want to do? So first we want to generate data and I'll go through how to do that. I have the code already written, but I'll walk through it. Then we want to generate model. Then we want to fit this model and then we want to analyze or graph the results. And so um, all of these will be covered for simple um, quantum data today. And so let's just jump right into the code. I already have it written. If I do this, we can see the code right here. So we're using TensorFlow Quantum as you can see, imported up here. Note that since I'm working on Windows, this is uh, not the most current release. 0 0.4 just came out. This is uh, not 0 0.3 point something, um, but the most current release is not available on Windows. And this is Python 3.7.5, TensorFlow 2.1, which is a requirement, TensorFlow Quantum. The older versions don't work with TensorFlow 2.3, Circ is the circuit builder. Um, and I'll be working with that in my general quantum computing series. Um, SimPy, it's just, I, I haven't really worked with it a much, but it's, it's what they use for representing the quote unquote weights or parameters. Um, and so, yeah, so jumping right in, in, into it, we can see very short, very easy to work with. Um, so we can see, first of all, like I said, the first thing we do, maybe I should zoom in here. Um, the first thing we do is generate the data. Zoom in even more. Um, we generate the data here. And so we generate training and testing, really validation. Um, and so a thousand um, examples of training and a hundred examples of testing is all we're gonna need. And so in order to do that, um, no, this is actually, more than it needs to be in terms of code. We just generate a qubit and it has to be grid qubit. Um, 
there are line qubits, but those I, I advise against working with those. And so then we go through and we make a circuit. We rotate it. We either rotate it a little bit to get some uncertainty around the z-axis or rotate it down to be the negative. So basically we're doing either approximately nothing or approximately an X gate, uh, which you can see here. Then we just append that to the training data. We label it. We say, okay, you know, if it's uh, up, we label it one. If it's down, we label it zero. Then we just generate the testing data. None of this so far has utilized any aspects of TensorFlow Quantum. This is all within CERC. So if you don't understand this code, I recommend you look at into CERC's documentation or CERQ. I don't, I don't actually know how they how they say it. Um, this is the first part, and this is a very important and useful function. So TensorFlow Quantum converts. In order to um, work with circuits, you have to actually convert this into data that TensorFlow can understand. And so it converts it into these very long <laughs> strings of, you know, it breaks down the gates basically. And that's why you'll notice the input of the model is a string. Um, but this is the first uses of TensorFlow Quantum. So we convert the training set and the testing set just directly into TensorFlow ten uh, tensors. And that's, that's all we need to do. We can just call this. This is important. You can't. It doesn't take in TensorFlow Quantum. Doesn't take in circuits. It takes in strings that you have to, or tensors of data type string. So make sure that you convert any data you want into tensors. And so basically, this is just generating the data. So now we have our first step. We have generated our data. Now we want to create the model. So we have our generate our single qubit. All of this is operating on a single qubit. And now we need to define. Um, what we want to read out. So TensorFlow Quantum allows you to do um, specify a, a readout operator. So this is basically what basis you're looking at it in. Or, you know, in this case, we're looking in the x, you know, axis. Um, you can also do multiple. So I could add a circ dot y here. Um, that would probably break the code. But you can read out in multiple. Um, Bases as well. You just need to have then multiple correct sort of values. Uh, so we see the inputs here. Um, every input, unless you're doing some sort of hybrid model um, or something like that, the input is always going to be a string because that's how it breaks down TensorFlow Quantum, how it breaks down the circuits, it breaks them into strings. And so this is just um, to print it, oh, just to print the circuit. Um, but here we see. Um, the parametrized quantum layer, this very much matches the Keras sort of uh, layers model. So, you know, normal TensorFlow, like here you have TensorFlow.Keras thus layers. Um, and so the parametrized quantum um, layer uh, first takes this uh, circuit. So you uh, make the whatever circuit you want to learn. And this is the parametrized circuit. Um, it takes out the readout operators, um, which is just as specified before what you're extracting from the information. Um, this part is an, an important distinction. This implicitly, um, I, I should perhaps clarify this. There's two types of sort of follow-ups to the parametrized quantum layer um, for these readout operators. You can do repetitions in which you actually sample the quantum circuit repeatedly, in this case, 32 times, or you can do expectations. So if I actually just deleted this, this isn't necessary. If I just deleted this, this would inherently do the expectation value, um, which is, um, you know, there's reasons why you would do both. In this case, I'm just going with repetitions just for the sake of, <laughs> um, more realism, I guess. Um, we have to specify a differentiator. In this case, we're using the parameter shift differentiator. Um, I might do a more complex mathematical video on that. But basically, what the parameter shift differentiator does is it just, um, you know, makes a little fluctuation in each parameter, samples that, 
and uh, adjust the parameters based off of that. It's it's a it's a, a pretty standard differentiator. And then we initialize it. We just initialize it all to zero. Um, there's different initialization techniques that you might want to use for the Baron plateaus problem, which is a big problem in um, quantum computing. And as before, you pass in the inputs and in standard TensorFlow format. Then you create the model. This is super simple. Um, and you just have inputs and outputs. And then you compile it. In this case, we're using, you can use traditional optimizers um, because this is a differentiator. And so we can just differentiate through the circuit and therefore get the gradients to optimize. Um, we're just using hinge loss because it is um, negative one or one binary classifications. And here we just use this hinge accuracy, which just, it's just the accuracy. TensorFlow does weird things sometimes with if you use the default sort of accuracy here, um, but we can just see that all this says is checking, you know, the accuracy and the, and so now before we get into the fitting, I want to talk about the make circuit. So here we define the symbols that we're learning in this case, just three parameters, because all the circuit does is it's just a parameterized RX, RY and RZ. Um, and so we first create a circuit. And then we apply these um, symbols onto the circuit. Um, these are, you know, entirely sort of handled by TensorFlow Quantum, and then we return the circuit. Uh, another note: this is unrelated, but I just want to make sure that it's covered. Is that these differentiators are sort of uh, consumed by each uh, operation? So if you, you know, define your differentiator outside of the, um, I'm not gonna do it here actually. If you define it outside of it and try to use it for multiple models, it will break because these differentiators are sort of consumed by one model. So uh, that's why I usually just define it, you know, even in long form in here. And so in order to fit, we can, um, it's very easy to do with, uh, if we're using, you know, we can use traditional um, sort of techniques to um, calculate the gradients, such as gradient tape and TensorFlow 2, but it's easy if you have this sort of nice data to just use the Keras fit function. So we have the train, the training labels. Um, we define the epoch, so we're doing it for 64. We define batch size, and this enables TensorFlow quantum enables batching, and we define the validation data. And then at the end of this fitting, I'll print the trainable weights. And then this is just plotting. You can see we use the same history um, from the model.fit. And so this is pretty um, basic usage of TensorFlow Quantum, but the things I just want to reinforce are in order to use the parameterized layer, you want to make sure you have a circuit definition. You want to make sure that the input type is string for pure for this pure quantum sense. Make sure you specify readout operators and they're what you want. And acknowledge that you're choosing either expectation or sample values. And so the rest of this, this is basically the ex, you know, all the TensorFlow quantum usage for now. And so um, once we actually run this code, which I will do right now, uh, we can see it's just as quick um, as any normal sort of uh, code, TensorFlow code, if we do, so we can specify that this is a single qubit classification. And if we run it first, it'll take a little bit to generate the data because it's making thousands of circuits right now. Um, and then we will print out, you'll see that I'll print out exactly what the training or learning circuit looks like. So we can see it's a RX gate, RY gate, RZ gate. And the input is sort of the circuit that's before this. So we can see it's training just like normal TensorFlow um, sort of fit function does. It has this nice interface. And you can see, you know, it goes very quickly. Um, we'll just wait a second for it to finish. Uh, I, I do it for longer than these two. You notice that the hinge accuracy for both validation and training is already 100%. Um, but I just want to show the learning, the loss curves. And so now 
once this is done, I will um, share this uh, window. Um, okay, so here you will be able to uh, see the, if I move this, this is the training loss. Uh, we can see it decreases uh, until it's sort of, that, that. that's why I went uh, longer than the accuracy suggested is we can see that, you know, it decreases until it sort of reaches a, a minimum. And, and then we can see after I close out of this, we will be able to see the, uh, let me add it in, we'll be able to see the um, accuracy. So we can see it's a little rough, it might be better to average it. Um, but we can see that it increases both of them you know, ever since about epoch 16 or so, have 100% accuracy. And so we can see that this is, you know, this is the curves that you want to see when you're doing the machine learning applications. And so now, oh, don't want to do that. We can see at the bottom here that there, um, that we have the weights. These are the associated parameters. So you can notice that, um, you know, these might look meaningless to you, but it's important to note that, um, you know, maybe it'll make it less meaningless if you know that um, this is approximately uh, pi over two, pi over two is 1.57. Um, this is, so these are both approximately pi over two and pi over four is approximately 0 0.78. So we can see, you know, because there's, you know, it's not perfectly lined up um, with the Z, axis or slight variations um, we can see that there is uh, you know there basically you know this makes sense in terms of what it should be learning it's rotating around to get it to the appropriate x axis and so this is also why sampling is important because um, if we have more probabilistic um, sampling so if i just repeat once we may actually, I don't know if this is gonna be the case, but we may notice a difference um, because uh, I'm running it right now, because if we sample it only once, there's, you know, it's probabilistic, uh, you know, it could be measured at a different uh, different side because it's not 100%, uh, you know, certain, the loss isn't zero. I don't know if this is gonna have any impact. I guess we will see. Yes, so you can see here how the hinge accuracy and the loss are staying very, okay, um, now, now they're starting to increase. Um, but you can see it, it's taking a lot longer to reach this point because as you sample it um, only once, this sort of the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics sort of impedes um, this process. And so you want to make sure that if you are using sampling, I mean, if you, if you want to sample it once, then you can. Um, and, and there may be incentive to, you can see that the actual, let me share the, the graphs with you. Um, you can see that the actual um, loss function gets pretty small towards the end. And the accuracy um, is uh, going towards 100%, you can see, but not quite there, it doesn't train as fast. And so there's, you know, there's cost benefit analysis there that once you get into more quantum machine learning, you can really investigate more. But for now, um, that is going to be it. So just to review, you know, if we went over this, you know, data model fit analyze the paradigm is the same. You just have to adjust your data, either be quantum or classical. Next time I will go over how to convert or some techniques for working with classical data in quantum machine learning. Um, and then you want to make sure that you use this parametrized quantum layer to learn certain parameters, have the circuit, make sure you have the correct readout operators. Um, and all this code will also be posted. So I will share this and yeah, so that's all for today. And make sure you check out TensorFlow Quantum for yourself. And yep.